It gives me great pleasure to introduce this uh, workshop on the uh, Ethiopian cross uh, in the Museo Nazionale del Bargello in Florence. The project was initiated through a larger project on the Mediterraneo Nero, the Black Mediterranean, that was funded and is funded by the uh, Getty Foundation um, under the rubric of Connecting Art Histories. The project is to, indeed, as the name suggests, connect art histories and bring together scholars from various parts of the world to join and exchange uh, ideas, uh, methods, and approaches to the works of art from various collections and from their uh, own home countries. So here we are, the guests of Paola D'Agostino, Dr. Paola D'Agostino, who is the director of the Musei del Bargello, the, a group of museums in Florence that include, of course, the, the jewel in the crown being the the Bargello itself, as well as the Medici chapels, which yes. are another major jewel in the crown, and who has permitted us to come here and study this cross uh, with our fellows who have arrived, again, under the auspices of the Getty um, Foundation um, generosity, who have come here from Ethiopia and are spending six months at Itati in Florence working on topics of uh, the connection between um, Ethiopia and uh, East Africa with the Mediterranean and Italy in the early modern period. So we're here with a larger group uh, who will all speak uh, one by one and discuss their findings. It's been a very exciting uh, day looking at the object. Uh, Dr. Uh, D'Agostino allowed us to remove it from the case and look at it up close and uh, decipher the writing and the inscriptions and, the, um, and analyze the metal. So it's been a, a very exciting time. And I will now give her the, uh, the microphone, so to speak, to present it as she knows it from the point of view of the collection of the Bargello. Thank you, Alina. And we are all very excited of this workshop because the cross has been in the collections of the Bargello since the late 19th century. And it arrived with a series of metalwork objects, uh, mainly religious, but it was only in the 1980s that there was um, a sort of like more modern display and the room, which is the chapel and the sacristy, uh, especially devoted to religious metalwork. Um, we have several catalogues about the Western metalwork used in religious functions, but up to this day, we know very little about these intriguing objects that during the recent display of two years ago, the curators of the room, Matteo Ceriana with Marco Colareta and Benedetta Chiesi, decided to place in a very prominent view to raise the question of the cultural and artistic exchanges between Italy and um, the African world. So we are all very uh, intrigued by what will come out with the workshop and hope that after this uh, days of discussion we can learn more and be able to offer to the next visitors to the museum a more informed uh, tale about this intriguing uh, and almost unique in Italy and very rare in Europe work of art. Thank you very much, Paola. We're very grateful to you. We're here on a day when the museum is closed. We're able to have it all to ourselves, which is a very precious moment. It doesn't happen often in any art historian's career. I just wanted to introduce our uh, the coordinator of this workshop, and that is Dr. Ingrid Greenfield, who is a specialist um, in um, African and Italian works of art uh, exchanges and collections in the early modern period. So she has masterminded the workshop, the guest list, and she will coordinate and, um, and uh, discuss with the participants um, the various uh, issues that are on the table.
The Masterclass format explores an object in a Florentine museum collection, and it aims to bring together different perspectives, art historical, curatorial, as well as methods from historians of culture, economy and religion, and material science, all in an effort to uncover some of the rich history of cross-cultural interaction between the African continent and the Italian peninsula. Our investigation of the processional cross itself took place at the Bargello Museum, involving in-person analysis of the visual imagery, metallurgical testing, and much discussion between the scholars. This was accompanied by a workshop at Itati with the participants as well as with our academic community. This is where pressing issues were identified, including the presence of two artistic hands on the cross, transcriptions and translations of the text, and the question of when the cross arrived in Europe and how it made its way into the Medici collection. And finally, in a roundtable discussion, directions for future research were proposed. For the masterclass and workshop, we invited two special outside guests. Dr. Jacopo Nishi and Dr. Ainsley Harrison. Jacopo Nishi is a lecturer in the art and art cultures of the Global South at UCL, and he's also a visiting scholar at the British Museum. He's published several articles on Ethiopian studies, Ethiopian art, and has multiple catalogs in the works, as well as a monograph on book illumination in the Ethiopian Empire. Ainsley Harrison is an objects conservator and the head of the sculpture and decorative arts conservation at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Her primary area of research is the technical examination and analysis of historic and archaeological metals. The masterclass and workshop also depended upon the involvement of our two Itati Getty fellows. Dr. Duresse Ayanachu is in residence as a fellow this semester and his research focuses on the medieval history and archaeology of Ethiopia, and he's published on topics including um, the interactions and integrations of the Christian kingdom with medieval megalithic and Islamic cultures. Dr. Alibechu Belay Biru is an assistant professor of archaeology and heritage studies at Deborah Behan University in Ethiopia. He's been part of different archaeological excavation miss missions in Ethiopia and in France, and currently he is researching medieval megalithic and church archaeological sites in the central highlands of Ethiopia. We were also lucky to have two other Itati fellows present whose work touches on the significant cross-cultural interactions between Africa and the Italian peninsula. Dr. Sheikh Sene is currently the Itati DHI Fellow, and he'll be continuing on as the Itati Getty Fellow in the academic year 2023-2024. Broadly speaking, his work deals with the relationship between African and European societies in the context of empire, imperialism, and colonialism in Africa, with a particular focus on the slave trade. Dr. Sine offered the workshop a comparative framework for the study of West Africa and Ethiopia, exploring the possibilities of historical East-West exchange. Dr. Matteo Salvadore currently holds the Berenson Fellowship at Itati. He's broadly trained as an African and world historian, and he holds an associate professorship at the American University of Sharjah. His work explores the early modern dealings between the Kingdom of Ethiopia and Renaissance Europe. And in recent years, he's been working on the life histories of diasporic Ethiopians in early modern Mediterranean and Indian Ocean worlds. So um, we're here at the Bajello to um, look at this uh, 15th century Ethiopian uh, processional cross. Um, and just to give a bit of context, uh, we are looking at a country in the Horn of Africa uh, which embraced Christianity since late antiquity and from that point in time onwards uh, adopted uh, crosses as part of the daily life of uh, Christian Orthodox uh, Ethiopians. With my colleagues uh, over the past few days, um, we've been talking about this cross, uh, um, which is a puzzling object in uh, many ways, but to give an overview of some of the points that we've been thinking about, first of all, its function, uh, this is a, a processional cross, 
Uh, that is to say, um, it's a cross that is mounted on a pole and carried in liturgical procession. As far as we can tell, um, some of the earliest processional crosses that we have uh, date from the 12th and 13th centuries. Um, and starting from that point onwards, a variety of materials uh, were used for the production. And these included gold, silver, copper alloys, and of course, wood. Um, at the point in time at which this cross were made, so around the 15th century, we know that all of these materials were used um, and that there were also debates uh, within the context of the Ethiopian church as to what materials might have been more appropriate for sacred objects. So there were some groups of believers that um, believed that gold was the most appropriate material for sacred objects, whereas others opposed those views and preferred uh, objects such as wood uh, by virtue of its connection to the cross of the crucifixion. Jacopo, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the form and the function of processional crosses in the context of Ethiopia in the 14th and 15th centuries. Um, I'm wondering about the use of metal, um, but also about perhaps how forms changed over time, um, the importance of the cross, and um, the imagery that took hold in the 15th century that we see on both sides of this. Um, so, um, Christian Ethiopians have a long-standing relationship with um, crosses, um, dating back to the conversion of Christianity in uh, late antiquity. Um, and starting from that point onwards, they would have employed a variety of cross types for different uh, spiritual and liturgical purposes. And uh, that included the range of objects, such as processional crosses. Um, that is, these are crosses um, that would have been, have a hollow shaft, and would have been mounted on a pole to be carried in liturgical processions um, and which would have had um, frequently textiles um, wrapped around the holes of this shaft for, again, devotional reasons. One of the most interesting features um, from a formal point of view of this cross is, um, and this is a point that we were debating also with, with Ainsley, is that it seems to be the result of at least two different stages of production. So we have a phase A and a phase B, if not more, um, and so uh, there, the, the, just to talk about the features a bit, so we have in the three crosslets which surround this scene, we have a group of um, seven archangels, and then at the central uh, panel we have a representation of the crucifixion. Now uh, these three ar these archangels are very much um, executed as well as the cross uh, in a style um, that brings to mind other examples of crosses um, from the reign of Emperor Yeshak. Uh, so we're looking here at uh, the first quarter of the 15th century. However, when we turn our attention to the central panel, um, this brings to mind works of art that were produced in Ethiopia in the second half of the 15th century as a result of these exchanges uh, with um, European craftsmen. So this cross is exquisitely and extensively decorated. We have a series of fields and borders decorated with interlaced patterns uh, that uh, bring to mind the sorts of decorations that we find in Ethiopian manuscripts dating to the 14th and 15th centuries. And then we have a series of figurative scenes. We have archangels uh, surrounded by birds on these crosslets. And then at the center, the main scene on the cross, we have on one face a representation of the crucifixion, where we have Christ in the center surrounded by uh, John and Mary, and then we have a representation of uh, the Virgin and Child on the other side. One of the most uh, interesting features of the cross is that it appears to have been decorated by at least two different hands. And so among the points that suggest this, uh, the, 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 the writing uh, over here above the archangels and above the crucifixion appears to be from a different hand uh, than from the writing that um, uh, is used on, on this extensive decoration, which mentions the fact that the king was, that the cross was donated by Emperor Brother Mariam. And likewise, there seem to be two hands at work uh, in the archangels, um, which are executed in a style which brings to mind works of art produced at the beginning of the 15th century in Ethiopia, uh, especially during the reign of King Yashak. Whereas uh, the image of the crucifixion and of the Virgin and Child are executed in a style which brings to mind works produced 
uh, towards the second half of the 15th century, when a considerable number of European artists and artworks had reached the country. So this speaks to the possibility uh, that these central panels may have been executed at a later date, uh, either by a European artist who was, had traveled to Ethiopia, or possibly by an Ethiopian artist who was engaging with some of the European artworks that were being imported in Ethiopia at this point in time. Um, this cross um, poses a series of challenges to us. It confronts us with a series of questions. And one set of questions has to do uh, with uh, when and where it was produced. Another set of questions has to do uh, with the purpose with which it was made. Uh, the inscription mentions that it was donated to uh, a monastery, possibly Gogora, possibly Gegere. Um, and this suggests that the object was part of a, a broader pattern of um, uh, royal patronage. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that um, Ethiopian emperors at this point in time in the 15th century, as in the previous centuries, often uh, donated objects and lands to churches, um, partly to reinforce the ties between church and state, but also partly as a way to enhance their chances of um, salvation. Another complex question has to do with when this object um, came to Europe. Um, and it's a difficult question to resolve without any kind of archival documents that give us uh, evidence of where it was prior to 1771 uh, when, it was, when it came to the Uffizi. Um, we know that because of the exchanges that occurred between uh, Europe and Ethiopia, starting from the 15th century onwards, a great deal of material culture flowed back and forth between Europe and Ethiopia. So certainly uh, this cross speaks to that those moments of interaction that begin with this period and that continued uh, with, with intensity until the beginning of the 17th century, uh, uh, up to the point in time where the Jesuits were expelled from the country, uh, but it's also a movement that didn't entirely stop after the Jesuits were expelled. So we have a really wide uh, chronological range for uh, when the cross arrived in Europe. Another interesting aspect on the cross, which is to consider, is its significance. Um, and by that, I refer both to the significance that it would have had uh, for Christian Orthodox Ethiopians in the 15th century, uh, that is to say to the people um, who donated the cross and to whom it was donated, but it's also really interesting to think about the cross's significance uh, in Europe when it would have arrived and the way in which the object was interpreted in uh, European scholarship uh, on uh, the material culture of, Ethiopian, of the Ethiopian Empire starting from the 19th century onwards. And on this note, um, this cross, one of the reasons for which this cross drew considerable attention by scholarship is the fact that it has these images which bear traces of these European images that reached Ethiopia at this point in time. And uh, this was a period when uh, European scholars, also because of uh, the sort of colonial environment which was around them, were particularly keen to identify instances uh, where uh, foreign artists had an impact on the heritage of non-European countries. So that was a way to show, overemphasize the importance of um, the European contribution on the history of non-European peoples. The, the harag, you know, we call it the harag, all the decorations, you know, this is you know, omnipresent in this, in this, in the, on these crosses, that the, um, the harag also, or the harag, the interlands of decorations is very, very important also in this time because the the time where the embellishing of all uh, was, you know, metals, stones, or churches, the royal churches were decorated in the same manner, and also uh, the, the parchment also, you know, also decorated in the same, in the same, same manner, and also the, the, the clothes also you know, in this time, it was the beginning of also uh, making, making uh, decorations in the same manner. So we, we see that this interlance can, can, can also imply that the unity, they know that the time in the medieval period, they demanded, the states demanded that the unity of the, the, the kingdom, because 
when the division of churches, where there is a church division, there was there is a, always a, the kingdom divisions. So that's why they, they they were advocating on the you know the unity of the 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 church and the state, and also it is expressed or demonstrated on on the decorations of the uh, this cross also also the other uh, uh, materials. And the other thing I have to add also, you know, we have an interesting uh, history of that, as, as I've said, that the unity of the, the Old Testament and with the New Testament. So we have this, the five, you know, the number five is, you know, probably represents the Pentateuch of the book of Moses from uh, Genesis to Deuteronomy. So this ca just implies that, you know, the, the New Testament is based on the Old Testament. This 15th century text gives us a number of information on this, on this, uh, on this cross. The first one is who, who made it, who patronized it. Patron, the patronage of this cross is King Bede Mariam, who reigned from 1446 to 1478. And, uh, and it says that you know, this was given to a, a, a church. We don't know if this, the church is not mentioned. So uh, uh, in, in, the, in the Amhara region, to the Amhara, this is the central highland of Ethiopia, and from where his, you know, his, from where he count his descendants, he is a, uh, Amhara is the cradle of the Solomonic dynasty. So that began in 1270. So he, this king, also uh, well known for the 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 appeasing of the. The, the last king or the, his, uh, his father's king, his father's reforms, because we know that this cross also, the, the moment, the time when the anti-reverence to the cross, to the Mary, to the icons, to the icons of the, uh, the, the, the sun also was, uh, you know, in a, in a very big, huge uh, challenges uh, of the time. The king did this, in my view, King did this so three important uh, these three important opposed by the Estefanites. This uh, the cross uh, itself, and second the, the, this depicted uh, uh, portraits or the, the, the cross crucifix, crucifix of the, the, the Jesus Christ. And also here we have also the uh, in Amharic we call the word in Amharic Thukruwalda with. Uh, Virgin with her child, and also, the, and we have the angels also here. So we have also the seven angels uh, also depicted on this uh, cross. All this together, at that time, they were they were a movement who opposed this uh, uh, this veneration of the crosses. And in the in the same period, when uh, the father of the king Buda Maria, you uh, know. Uh, uh, judged the, the Stephanites to be persecuted, particularly brutally they were persecuted, and the king himself he put a cross over his palaces also, and uh, he, he, this cross, you know, veneration of cross was at that, at that time it was enforced or pressurized, uh, imposed by his father. So we see, we see that you know the the change of the. the the cross, because the cross, you know, so it has a long history in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, from the time of Aksum, the, after uh, Christianity was considered now taken as a state religion, and then we see here, uh, this is a time of the cross veneration. This is the beginning of the, the time of uh, cross veneration. So, Bede did the same, the same thing to to his father uh, uh, Zil, and that was, you know. The veneration of cross in Ethiopia since the 15, the 15, particularly 1454. At that time, they were judged. These Stephanites were judged and persecuted. And at this time, when this cross was made, also it's, it's, it's a moment. You know, it's an interesting time. It's a moment because uh, this, this king himself was persecuting this the Stephanites. So we know that now. Uh, his intention, how you know the the the, the veneration of uh, uh, crosses was you know in, in, internalized or in, integrated into the 
uh, tradition and culture of Ethiopia since that period. So generally, the issue of cross in Ethiopia is uh, quite deep-rooted, and uh, we do have, you know, uh, quite uh, detailed tradition, uh, goes back even to the time of, you know, this uh, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, that means the time before the birth of Jesus Christ, it was in BC. So, and even after the, you know, process of this redemption, cross is all about the redemption of, uh, redemption of uh, human beings, how human beings got redeemed because of the crucifixion of Jesus. And that is uh, an important issue when it comes to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is amongst the nations that, you know, accepted Christianity earlier. So we can, we can just see how important religious symbol uh, this cross is in Ethiopia. As a result, you do have, you know, different ways that uh, kings across time tried to, you know, imprint their, their uh, honor towards the Holy Cross. For example, if you go to, back to the time of uh, Aksum in the ancient time, in the fourth century, when uh, this uh, uh, tradition became quite official, by then kings were trying to imprint the cross on the coins. And they were also trying to curb churches out of rock dedicated to the Holy Cross. You do also have this kind of tradition that goes all the way to the uh, me early medieval period or the early Middle Ages in Ethiopian, you know, periodization. So there we have several cruciform churches curved out of rock, like the one that we have in Lalibala, which is dedicated to St. George, but still in cruciform. And the kings of Ethiopia in those days were also, you know, uh, taking the Holy Cross or, uh, you know, portraying their uh, uh, honor, devotion to the Holy Cross by taking it as a regnal name, like Gebra Meskel. So we do have a series of kings with this uh, regnal name Gebra Meskel, which is literally mean the servant of the cross. So in all these ways, Ethiopian kings uh, in the ancient and early medieval time were trying to associate themselves and express their deep-rooted, you know, honor and devotion towards the Holy Cross. And when we just come to the time when this uh, cross was made, that means the 15th century, that was a turning point in, uh, in general in the history of Ethiopian church. That is when, you know, several, uh, you know, works were composed praises for the cross, for example, by the famous church scholar, uh, by Gorgorius, in the late 14th and early 15th century, he was a contemporary of King David, King Zerayko, who were, you know, quite prominent in dealing with uh, this glorification of the Holy Cross, St. Mary, and the entire church. And that was a time when this glorification, veneration of cross got, you know, upgraded. And the feast of this Holy Cross became, you know, more a tradition. It was, you know, there even before, during the Aksumite and the Zagwe period, but this time became a special order of feasting, venerating, serving, honoring the Holy Cross, almost parallel to that of the veneration and the devotion that we have to the Virgin Mary. Ethiopian clergy, monks were traveling even during this time, in the 14th, 15th century, they were traveling uh, to Egypt, where there are uh, still monasteries, and uh, you do also have Ethiopian churches owned by Ethiopia itself, which are in the Holy Land, Jerusalem. And Ethiopian monks and clergy were coming here to Europe. So you can see, you know, an interplay, mobility of these uh, religious figures, and that obviously has something to do with the mobility of objects as well. So we can, we can view the coming of this Holy Cross uh, to this part of Europe, or its final destination here in the museum, can be traced back in a systematic way, looking at the tradition and the mobility of different religious figures, monks, and clergies 
from Ethiopia to Egypt and then to the Holy Land, to Europe and so on. So this could tell us, you know, uh, uh, many things and it obviously ignites to question how the ecclesiastical connections went on during the medieval period, the Renaissance time and so on. So in Ethiopia, this cross could tell us, you know, the continuation of the tradition. So it, we do have different traditions which are actually prevalent here in the West as well. So the tradition about the finding of the true cross, which is quite prominent in Ethiopia, and the celebration of the feast of this finding of the Holy Cross uh, on uh, September 26, 27, and uh, it is final placement or the, the arrival of the piece of the true cross to Ethiopia during the reign of uh, King David. That means the grandfather of the patron of the making of this cross, Bedemare. So he was the one who received the piece of the Holy Cross from Egyptian, uh, you know, bishops, and then he transferred it uh, to his son because he was. Uh, passed away, and then his son, the Reikov, finally, you know, placed that piece of Holy Cross at a cruciform mountain called Ambagishen. So you do have a series of feasts still associated with the finding of the True Cross, and this feast actually is registered as uh, one of the intangible heritage of humanity by UNESCO in 2013. And because of the, you know, the expansion of Christianity and ecclesiastical craftsmanship from the central highlands, the northern highlands, down to the southern part of Ethiopia, the tradition went together, like in the areas that we have today in southern Ethiopia, Gamo, Walaita, and that of Gurage. The feast and veneration of cross has got a special, you know, cultural, uh, cultural uh, manifestation. So in this area, people are trying, you know, to really venerate cross in a different way. For some, it is a new year, the Feast of the Holy Cross. They used to celebrate it for weeks, and they do have different cultural elements associated with it. So you can find traditions associated with the finding of the true cross, Queen Helena, and back in time, King Solomon, and Queen Sheba. So such an interconnected tradition of the Holy Cross still is being dramatized in Ethiopia. That is a special feature. And in the meantime, it has historical roots from the fourth century and even before in some cases. And it, it has its own imprints on the landscapes, on the rocket churches, and you do have several cruciform churches. You do have churches dedicated to the Holy Cross. And the cultural manifestations across the country makes this cross special in the history and even in the lives of Ethiopians even today. So that's, that is what makes the issue of cross, the making of cross, uh, quite special in this regard. So the presence of this cross in this museum is really an important, uh, you know, issue, an important uh, object or subject that we can say that allows us really to think a lot about the material connection the artifactual connection existed between the western part of this uh, Mediterranean, northern Mediterranean, and that of uh, sub-Saharan African nations, particularly of Ethiopia. It could tell us a lot, the inscription, the materials that may surround it, and the use of, you know, this cross as a symbol. So the high, high level of uh, making of this cross, or its appearance as one of the best crosses that we can have, in Ethiopian history could tell us a lot. We may just even think that this cross might have been, you know, presented as a gift for the contemporary uh, royalties of this area. That is an important issue because it is not an ordinary cross. Uh, so that, that can also be seen as, as, as a subject. It can be of, you know, a topic of further investigation. I'd like to hear what Matteo Salvadori, who's a specialist in the history of the relationships between Ethiopia and the Italian peninsula, has to say about um, the chronology of um, the movement of objects from Ethiopia to Italy, who might have initiated these kinds of um, encounters, and whether or not um, the cross has something to say about those um, histories of of context. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. This is such a, such a fascinating object 
Uh, it was produced uh, in the late 1400. Um, so that's about uh, 100 years into uh, rather uh, intense Ethiopian-European relations. Uh, Ethiopian delegations uh, and Ethiopian pilgrims uh, began to arrive in Europe in the early 1400 and continue to do so uh, for the entire century. So the delegations that arrive in, uh, in Europe, um, they are dispatched by the emperor of Ethiopia for a variety of reasons. Um, Ethiopian rulers are looking for allies. Um, they're also looking uh, for technological transfer. They're looking for artisans, uh, masons, and of course, they're also looking for artists. They are building churches. They are adorning their churches. Um, and so there is, there is a, really a multifaceted uh, interest uh, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and the delegations that arrive in Europe are, are the manifestation of this desire to explore uh, Latin Christianity um, and to establish relations. We know uh, we have records of a variety of, uh, of objects that make it to Europe. Unfort unfortunately, uh, this cross is not among them, uh, so it remains for, for now a little bit of a mystery. And of course, we also know of a, we know about the formation of a community of foreigners uh, known as Ferenges in, uh, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, and among them, we have artists, uh, uh, masons, um, uh, painters, and uh, maybe uh, one of them or some of them were involved in the production of this cross. This cross is a bit, is a bit of a mystery because we know that it was, uh, it was produced in the late 1400. Uh, and we also know that it made it to Palazzo Vecchio at some point in the uh, 1770s. Uh, but other than that, uh, we are uh, in the dark as far as its uh, life. Uh, the chronology of its life. We have tried, we, we are making some hypotheses, uh, but um, as of now, uh, there are only educated guesses. For example, we know, uh, we know that um, artifacts uh, were uh, looted from churches uh, in Ethiopia during the invasion of the Sultanate of Adal. But we also know that most likely objects, uh, religious objects, would be uh, melted. Um, uh, for their metal value. Um, what about when the Jesuits left Ethiopia? Would they have taken any objects with them, especially objects with a sacred connection? That's, uh, that's another rather important uh, uh, possibility. Um, so the Jesuits were on and off in Ethiopia for about uh, 80 years, uh, although uh, most of their activities uh, date to the early 1600s. Um, um, the, the heyday of the Jesuit here in Ethiopia was um, in the first uh, three decades of the 17th century. Um, it is definitely possible that uh, once um, um, the Ethiopian emperor uh, Susenius converts and um, Catholicism is imposed uh, across the country, uh, and the Jesuits, take, the Jesuits take the control of um, Ethiopian churches, it is possible that uh, they decided to uh, remove this cross and the cross could have reached Goa and from there um, some location uh, in Latin Europe and eventually Florence. So we uh, have to... But, yeah. but, but to complicate that picture, I mean, it, it, it's certainly possible um, that the uh, Jesuits would um, have had the opportunity to take it, especially after the, the conversion of, 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 of um, Susenios. Uh, but at the same time, uh, from, from what they left in terms of writing, we know that they had a rather disparaging attitude uh, towards the material culture of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So that begs the question if they would have seen any value or not in collecting an artifact of this kind. Um, and of course, there's also all the, always the possibility that we've been discussing uh, that the object might have reached Europe by virtue of some Ethiopian pilgrims uh, traveling in the opposite direction. I don't know what you might think of it. You guys think about that. That's absolutely a possibility. Uh, we know that in the first half of the 16th century, um, dozens and dozens of pilgrims uh, reached uh, Rome and a variety of other locales uh, in, in Latin Europe. Um, they established a community um, uh, in Rome uh, near the Vatican, a community that became known as 
uh, the community of Santo Stefano degli Abissini, uh, uh, because it was associated with the church of uh, Santo Stefano. I find it very interesting that uh, this is one of uh, a few crosses that are uh, reaching Europe in the, in the 15th and in the 16th century. Crosses were a rather uh, popular gift um, um, brought over by uh, Ethiopian delegations to, uh, to Europe. We have, uh, uh, for example, we have evidence of a cross brought over uh, to Bologna in the early uh, 16th century by one of the many uh, Ethiopian delegations. Um, on the other hand, we have no evidence uh, that this cross was in fact a gift, uh, and its arrival is a, bit, uh, is a bit of a mystery. I find very interesting that, um, uh, unlike uh, the other scholars who have looked at the cross, and I have, have identified the cross with uh, 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 Gorgora, um, now, instead, after, after examining um, the inscriptions, uh, you pointed out that we're actually looking at a different location, which, as you said, is in, a, in Amhara, but in, uh, in historic Amhara, not the Amhara region yes. of, of that we know as Amhara today. Yeah, yeah th th that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, Garegeri, this, this, this inscription is interesting. We have three times the word Amhara. So the, it's, it's really, it was sent to a region of Amhara in that period in the 15th century. And uh, at this period, Amhara is well known as the, the central highland of Ethiopia. Gorgora is you known by, by that time, it is, for me, it is a periphery than you know, the center of the power. The, the, here, we know that also Bede Mariam built his royal church and the, his burial place was you know, the, the best you know, the well-known and the very big church now this is in ruin today also. So it is, it is probably given to the Gere, Gere, Gere. It is a place called, you know, Gere, Gere. We, are, we, will, we will find, and it, uh, the previous articles are really, they didn't read it well, and uh, we have to, you know, re-edit it to, uh, for the next edition to be well uh, understood, and, and it is uh, from, in, in its context of the, the, the text written uh, on the cross. We know that it's in the Amhara, it's, it is, you know, well written, Gere Gere, you know, the, the place where Gere Gere, the, the other articles are, you know, maybe we, we have to rewrite it or re-edit re the, the previous articles, so on the, on, the, on, the, on the place where. So if it is in the Amhara, as you know, if the place is Amhara, and it, is, it, has, it has been probably given to the royal churches. So in the moment of in, in, in the jihad period, that all the royal churches were you know, uh, <coughs> demolished, also you know, looted. And it is probable that this cross was circulating you know, from hand to, 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 from people to people. And we know that also we have another, many examples on this point. So it, it could be, you know, now in this period, we know that also we don't have the travelers who came, who, came, who, who, came, who came from Europe. So it is probably the agents who could have been uh, the Ethiopians who took to the Europe and then, uh, you know, uh, probably reached in, in, in Italy and then in, in Florence. We're lucky to have Ainsley Harrison here, an objects conservator who has run some preliminary tests on the material composition of the cross. Um, Ainsley, I know you can't say anything conclusively at this point, but can you tell us a little bit about the tests that you have run and what they've shown in terms of um, the metal the content that we find? Yes, uh, so the initial analysis uh, indicated that this cross it's a copper alloy cross, of course, um, but it has gilding on the surface. Uh, there was uh, evidence of mercury being present, as well as gold, uh, which indicates that it was fire gilt or a mercury amalgam gilt. Um, and I was able to analyze some of the areas that have the gilding worn away. So the areas that are a bit darker um, around here and the, uh, the alloy underneath the gilding appears to most likely be bronze, which is the combination of copper and tin. 
So Ainsley, this morning you've been conducting some testing of the metals, but you've also been using something called DinoLite. Can you tell us what that does and what you and Jacobo have been able to start to discuss based on what this DinoLite reveals? Absolutely, yes. Uh, one of the techniques that we usually use to examine the tool marks and fabrication methods of a cross is microscopy. Uh, usually in the lab, we'd use a stereo microscope so we could look at the cross. A DinoLite is a digital microscope, and so we can put it right up against the cross and see a, a very high magnification um, the types of tool marks that are on the cross and also the stratigraphy of those tool marks. So which tool marks were done first, uh, which came over that, which sort of uh, ended up having the metal pushed into those earlier tool marks. Uh, and we can also measure uh, the, the diameter or the thickness of the tool marks and compare those. Ainsley, what does XRF stand for? And what does it tell us when you point this object at the metal cross? Well, uh, XRF stands for X-ray fluorescence uh, and it uses an X-ray tube that's in the instrument uh, to bombard the sample with x-rays. So when it's held up against the object, uh, the atoms in the object uh, interact with those x-rays. So when the x-rays come back from the object, uh, the det detector can uh, measure the energy level and it produces a spectrum uh, that we can then match with what we know to be the characteristic energies of those elements. Um, so on a most basic level, the XRF can tell us what elements are present in a sample. Uh, what we like to do for metals is understand uh, or to measure and quantify what elements are present so that we know what alloy is being, being used. Uh, and in order to do that, we use calibrations. Uh, calibrations are uh, basically just calculations that are based on the analysis of a large number of known standards with known concentrations. Uh, and so the software interprets the energy that's coming back from the object uh, and can then produce results in weight percent. Uh, and so for those reasons, we can tell whether uh, this object has 95% um, copper or 92% copper. Uh, and how much percent of tin and things like that. During our analysis of the processional cross, we were joined by two of the Bargello Museum's curatorial staff, Benedetta Cantini and Benedetta Chiesi, who observed Ainsley Harrison's metallurgical testing of the processional cross. It was decided to put this object that, as you know, it's unique in the collection of the museum, but in dialogue with other cross, with other objects, with other jewelry in this chapel. And I think this is important, and also the, the, the day we have done today here, it's in this path to, to break the isolation of this cross and to put it in dialogue and in connection with what was made in the same period in the other part of Europe. And, uh, and as I said, it's unique, not only for the provenance, but also because it's one or really the unique object from Ethiopia that we have in the Bargello. When I say the unique, it's not correct, because uh, during the study for today, we have rediscovered uh, a book of 1936, that is a book of the exhibition made here in Firenze, in the Museo Antropologico, that is really a few minutes from the Bargello. And the exhibition was called uh, uh, Mostra dell'arte coloniale etiope. Uh, in that exhibition, this cross was displayed, and I don't know how, but the curator discovered another object from Ethiopia that is in the Bargello. And is uh, a parchment, uh, a samsul, painted later, that is from the 18th century, from the current collection. This cross has been cast, and it's been mm -hmm. cast in one piece. As you can see, that uh, porosity on the uh, shaft near the top. These are uh, indications that it was cast because these are uh, the sorts of casting flaws that you get when you have uh, a lost wax cast with a ceramic mold material. 
Um, and uh, when you have trapped air bubbles, the molten metal doesn't flow all the way through. Sometimes uh, you see indications like that. The analysis that we did uh, in order to be able to say that this is cast in one piece, uh, we were able to do compositional analysis of the cross and the shaft. And the composition is the same. Uh, if a lot of the uh, later crosses have a different alloy for the shaft than the cross, um, so that would have been apparent in XRF as well. Nous sommes aujourd'hui ici en présence d'une croix processionnelle éthiopienne qui date du Moyen Âge. Et donc la croix est fabriquée en bronze. Et le bronze est une matière qui circulait en Afrique à l'époque depuis l'Antiquité. Donc du coup, et on a vu qu'avec l'avènement de la traite négrière, il y a beaucoup de bronze qui ont été introduites en Afrique par les commerçants européens. Et donc, moi, je suis là dans le cadre de faire une petite comparaison entre l'histoire de cette croix et euh, l'art ouest africain. Donc, si on remarque, par exemple, le royaume du, du, du Bénin, la plupart des, des, des objets qui ont été euh, construits sont datés entre le XVI et le XVIIIe siècle. Et la plupart de ces objets sont en bronze. Donc, ce qui prouve que si euh, le bronze a circulé, durant la période de la traite atlantique. Donc ces souverains africains se sont enrichis et ils ont su fabriquer des objets en bronze à l'image du roi et à l'image de d'autres et d'autres masques, bien sûr. Et je suis aussi intéressé aux inscriptions qui sont lisibles sur la croix. Et d'après un premier article qui a été publié en 1874 par Ferdinand de Lastière, Donc, euh, il a essayé de faire euh, une traduction de l'écriture qu'on peut lire ici, soit disant qu'en fait, il y a une sorte de sacré dans le croix, que la croix était interdite, euh, ne pouvait pas sortir de l'église, donc c'était interdit. Et quiconque essaie de la faire sortir de l'église, elle sera frappée par la, la tonnerre. Donc, dans cette croix, il y en a cet aspect de la sacralité. Et l'aspect de la sacralité aussi, on la retrouve aussi dans la plupart des objets africains datant du XVI au XVIIIe siècle ou bien avant même. Euh, donc euh, c'est quelque chose qui nous lie, qui lie l'Afrique euh, de l'Ouest et, 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 et l'Éthiopie. Donc aussi euh, la présence de cette croix aussi à Florence euh, m'interpelle aussi parce que euh, si on peut faire la comparaison avec euh, les objets qu'on a, les objets d'art ouest africain, on les retrouve aujourd'hui dans plusieurs musées, que ce soit les musées du Quai Branly en France et d'autres musées américains et en Allemagne. Et récemment aussi, il y a un débat qui est d'actualité, c'est celui de la restitution, donc qui fait beaucoup polémiquer. Donc, euh, bah, il y en a qui sont d'accord pour que tous les objets d'art qui se retrouvent à l'étranger puissent être rapatriés dans leur pays d'origine. Et il y en a d'autres qui militent pour la circulation euh, des objets d'art entre l'Europe et, 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 et l'Afrique. Et moi, Je pense que cette décision est la plus sage. Parce que ces objets-là, bien vrai que même s'ils sont originaires de l'Afrique, ils ont pris racine dans les musées européens. Si on les amène, les amène en Afrique, ils vont manquer les musées européens. Et ils vont manquer aussi l'Afrique parce qu'ils ont été arrachés là-bas. Donc pour moi, la meilleure solution est de faire circuler les objets pour que, pour que les jeunes Africains aussi puissent avoir quelques connaissances par, en matière d'héritage qui, le, qui leur ont été légués par le, leurs ancêtres. Et voilà, donc, œuvrons, faisons de telle sorte que les objets circulent entre l'Europe et l'Afrique. Et pour moi, c'est ma vision de l'art. C'est celui de l'art universel. Merci. The masterclass and workshop revealed the extent to which interdisciplinary dialogue is really helpful in uncovering more about some of these little known or understudied objects in Florentine collections. As a natural extension of the workshop and the masterclass and in recognition of the importance of textual documentation in interpreting some of these objects from the African continent, 
our group made a small excursion to Rome, specifically to the Vatican Library and the Collegio Etiopico, which both contain records dating back to the early modern period and relate some of the experiences of Ethiopians in Rome in the 16th century. While texts record the presence of Ethiopian pilgrims in Rome throughout the 15th century, a panel of Filarete's bronze doors for St. Peter's Basilica actually offers a visual representation of a group of Ethiopians who arrived in the Italian peninsula and then went to Rome after attending the Council of Florence in 1441. Members of an Ethiopian embassy to Rome in 1481 may also appear in the frescoes of Botticelli and Tucci in the Sistine Chapel. Reconstructing the journeys taken by Ethiopian monks and pilgrims to the Italian peninsula and to Rome and Florence in particular in the 16th century might also contribute to our efforts to understand the route by which the Bargello's Ethiopian cross may have arrived in Florence. This kind of event offers a launch point for future scholarly collaboration where historians and art historians, material scientists come together to identify pressing questions about understudied African objects in European collections and we'll hope you'll be a part of it.